everybody. Welcome to the podcast. It may interest you to know. I'm Tony and Marcolini, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be joined today by actor Mitchell Whitfield. Welcome, Mitchell. Tony, thank you for having me. I'm excited too. I'm excited <laughs> to do this. I, I, I love talking about this stuff. So for me, it's fun also. I, you know, the one thing I have to say is unique, I think, about you uh, is that you've been successful in pretty much every entertainment category you oh, could stop. be. No, it's true, right? Broadway, Neil Simons plays on Broadway, um, the theater, uh, television, radio, and you've done voiceover work for, for some great, you know, uh, great cartoons, I guess you call them cartoons. It sounds You can child. still call them cartoons. I know people get caught up in it. It's an animation. It's like, you can still call it cartoons. I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm old enough that there still will always be cartoons to me. <laughs> Same here, yeah. Right. So, I mean, you pretty much hit every feel that you could be. And I want to try to get to as much as I can today. Sure. Uh, but I, I think I have to start where everyone probably recognizes you best from, I would think. But my cousin Vinny. It's either it's either one of two. When people recognize me, it's always and I've done a bunch of different movies and TV shows over the years, yes. but it's always either friends or my cousin Vinny. Right. So it's either one of the two Utes or Barry. It's it's always one of those things. And then just when I think it's like, oh, it's like, no, and then somebody will bring up some obscure movie that I did decades ago. I'm like, really? You're the one who saw that? But yeah, for the most part, it's definitely those two things. <laughs> now, something was is interesting to me because the main, the four like really main people, I guess um, you could say, you're all from Brooklyn. And I thought, like, was that like some criteria? I mean, you, you Marissa Torme, Ralph Macchio. I mean, all of you you know, started off in Brooklyn. Was that like some requirement to, you know, to on the it, film? It's very strange. I think uh, Marissa and I, I think, I think Ralph may have been Long Island, but we all have that New York connection. I think Ralph may have been Long Island. And I think Joe was actually New Jersey. So was he, was he, I thought he was born in Brooklyn. No, I think he's actually Jersey. I have to look that up, but you know what? But the core, we have that, we have that New York, that tri-state, I call it the tri-state area, of course, and you're based back East as well, right? I sure am. I'm born in Brooklyn, raised in Staten Island, now live in Jersey. <laughs> there you go. So you've got the trifecta going on there. So yeah, we had this whole New York connection. And Tony, the really weird thing was when I came out to California, I guess this will be my, in January, that'll be my January, 2023, depending on when people are listening or watching, will be my 33rd anniversary in California. And when I first came out and auditioned for my cousin Vinny, which was like the first year that I was here um, that long ago. And I remember my agent telling me, it's like, yeah, you're going in for this movie, but you know, they're really interested in New York actors. I'm like, well, I am a New York actor. I've only been out here for a year, but I'm from New York. That's, I'm re well, yeah, but they're looking for New Yorkers. I'm like, I am a New Yorker. I was born in Brooklyn. It doesn't get much more New York than that. And I could turn on that voice in a second. So, you know, at first they weren't really sure if they wanted to see me because, you know, they were, they were going back East to cast. I was like, no, no, I just happened to move out here. It's okay. I'm still authentic. And in fact, when I ended up screen testing for the movie and for people that are watching or listening that don't know how that process works, um, it's an old Hollywood thing that's, I think, still going on today where um, you'll audition for something. And when you're really close to getting to the role, they'll screen test you. And then what happens in a screen test is you normally sign your contract in advance before you actually go in for your final screen test. You're usually on camera with other actors. If the other characters have been cast already, you're reading opposite the regular, the actor that's already cast. Or if you're all being cast together, they mix and match. So you have this whole very nerve wracking process of screen testing. So the screen test was actually back in New York. So I did all my auditions out here. They said the screen test is actually back east. I had to fly back to New York for the screen test. They give you this two week window of the screen. Once the screen test is over, contractually, they have two weeks to let you know if you got the role or not. And then the, con or the contract's null and void. And on the last minute of the last hour, the last day, they let me know that I had the part. So it was really one of these Hollywood sitting by the phone. Oh, is, am I going to get the part? It was, it was crazy. It was really nuts. But yeah, so we had that, that big, strong New York connection, not only among the cast, but also going back east for, you know, going back to New York for the actual screen test. It was really cool. It was super cool. Do you remember who you screen tested with? Um, I screen tested with Ralph. So Ralph and I did screen test together. They mixed and matched. Um, what was the young actor's name from fame, which is funny because I actually went to the high school of performing arts too. So it was like the guy who played a character that was in that school was opposite me. I forget his name, but he was on fame, the TV show. I tested with him and I tested with Ralph. And I think also testing for my part at that time was Will Smith. 
I don't know. I, it was. It came down to between me and me and Will Smith for that role, which is the first and last time I was ever up against Will Smith for any role. Um, but I'm not sure. I think those are the only two that I tested with, and I didn't really get to see who the other actors were that were testing because they try and keep people separated as much as possible, so it's not right. awkward. Uh, Hollywood in a moment of caring about our feelings. So um, yeah, I think I only tested with two actors, but it was it was crazy. I mean. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing movie! It's still till today. It's it's my go to movie when I'm you know feeling blue. Uh, it's right. It's the movie I put it's on a, for. It's a comfort yeah. movie, right? It's one of those, yeah. and it's yeah, also absolutely. what's what's really weird about that, Tony, is it's also, and p most people don't really think about this. This is a comedy, but it's a procedural comedy that really is accurate in terms of the you know law legal procedure. And I know a lot of lawyers and a lot of, right. you know, judges love this because of that. And when you think about it, not a lot of comedies have that sort of dichotomy where they're full on physical, well-written comedies, but also do the procedure for law incredibly well. It's also a two hour and 20 minute movie. And when you think about comedies now, if you think about comedies today, where, you know, most movies are shorter today because they want to get, you know, the theaters rolling. They want to get the people coming in, going out, get more money in there. But to have a comedy that holds up for over two hours and 20 minutes, that's super rare also. That's a really rare thing. So that it's a comfort movie, but it's a really long comfort movie when you think about it. Yeah. Do you remember your first day on set? It had to be pretty exciting. It was really exciting. I remember getting there and it just, it, was, it wasn't my first movie. It wasn't even my first studio movie. I'd done a movie... Um, called uh, reverse i've done reversal of reversal fortune, of fortune right Jeremy, Jeremy irons yeah. yeah another legally you know entangled movie and then i had done a movie called dogfight which was a small warner brothers movie before that but it was my first With river phoenix right river yeah. Phoenix? Yeah. yeah me river richard Pontebianco, anthony clark lily taylor who's a beautiful amazing actress um and i had i had done those but this was my first going on location with a big, you know, a bigger budget at that time. I mean, it wasn't even a big budget by today's standards, but having my own house and, you know, having a driver, it was, it was very surreal. So I remember that first day just looking around saying, should I be here? Do they get this right? Did they mean Mitchell Whitfield? Maybe there was a Mitchell Whitefeld that they meant to cast, but, and it was, it was, no, it was really, it was really incredible. And the other thing that I remember, if you don't want me going on about this, cause it's just- No, no, I love it, I love it's it. It's still fresh in my mind today. I actually had to drop, I ended up dropping close to 40 pounds for that movie. Really? Yes, because I finished when I when I was in so I went to Colgate back east. Intentionally? Huh? Intentionally? Yes, it was intentional because uh, I was playing hockey out of college, so I was like a bigger guy. I was in good shape, and I was just like a bigger. You know, I'm not a tall guy, but I was. You know, I worked out a lot, and from hockey, I was a bigger guy. And I remember I kept that on, especially when I did dogfight because I was playing a marine, so I was working out a lot. So again, I had that weight on from doing dogfight as well. When it came down to my cousin Vinny, before the screen test, before I flew to New York for that mix and match screen test session, they called my uh, they called my agent and said, "Look, we want Mitchell to lose ten pounds for the screen test." They're like, "Oh, okay." Uh, you mind telling us why? They said, "Yeah, because there's a scene in the movie, and you know the scene well in the prison cell when Joe Pesci is coming in, and I don't know it's Vinny. I think he's one of the inmates to have a moment with me, and." Um, in that scene, when Joe comes in, if I'm 180 pounds and like several inches taller than Joe, visually, the intimidation didn't work as well. Like, why is this bigger guy so intimidated by Joe? Although he can be, he's an intimidating guy anyway, but visually it wasn't. So they said, have him lose 10 pounds for the screen test. So I did. Uh, the week before exercise, I ate a lot of vegetables and, you know, I really kept away from the carbs and I lost 10 pounds. They call me, they say, you got the roll. We start shooting in six weeks, lose 20 more pounds. It's like, wow, okay. So by the time I got there, and I, again, I did it safely, but it was, you know, I, I went from 180 to 140. So whenever I watch that movie now, I'm always sitting there going, oh, give that kid a sandwich. He looks so scrawny. So when I watch it now, I get very uncomfortable because I remember like, I don't feel like myself. Where's my, where's my mass? I don't feel like me. So yeah, ended up losing 40 pounds to do that movie. I, I did my own little De Niro Thing for that movie but uh you know without wow. his, you know yeah without his chops but still so what now did you film that on location in alabama at all no all these all the stuff that was supposed to be in alabama was actually done in georgia because the topography was very similar they both had that red clay earth and 
uh, a lot of the same visually if, if they could they could mirror parts of Alabama in the parts of Georgia that we were in. It was easier for them to do that there. So I don't know whether I think there was much easier. Georgia was a much friendly, more friendly state for shooting um, or they couldn't get locations in Alabama. But we were in we were in beautiful Georgia. So we have to talk about the six times as a charm scene. Oh, God. Right. <laughs> so so how, how do you keep a straight face filming that scene? Well, Tony. Keeping a straight face for me in that film was a challenge unto itself and not just for that scene. Cause that scene, I know when Joe's going on cause Joe's very straight face in his answers with me. Sorry, right. my chair is squeaking like crazy, but it's all part of the experience. Um, so that scene, I had fewer problems in that scene than I did in others. And I will give you like something that you can, this is your comfort movie. This is your go-to movie. I'm Absolutely. gonna give you a gift now when you go back to the movie to watch specifically, okay? When I'm sitting in the courtroom, so the stuff with Joe, yes, that was hard to keep a straight face. Not nearly as hard as in the courtroom when Austin Pendleman, my attorney, Austin Pendleton starts stuttering to the jury while he's taught. For the first time, we realized that my lawyer is a stutterer, which I had not known. The audience did not know. And I'm sitting there. I'm telling you, when he's doing his thing, there's not a clean shot of me not laughing. I try and incorporate it into what we're doing. There's a shot where they go back to the, the table of, you know, Joe, myself, and Ralph. And I'm sitting there, like, covering my face. And you see my shoulders going. It looks like I could be crying because I'm so upset. No, I was laughing the entire time. They had not one clean. And even the director came up to me and said, Mitchell, um, we kind of, you know, we need you to do this without laughing. I said, intellectually, I get that. I know that I shouldn't be laughing. I get that. But it's the execution of that. My body, the body wants what the body wants. And the body wanted to laugh. And what, what, the, what the director, the worst part about it, Tony, was the director was telling me, Mitchell, you've got to keep it together. And then when, when he called action, he turned his chair around away from me because he was laughing the whole time. So he couldn't keep a straight face either, but he wanted me to keep a straight face because I'm the one on camera that's supposed to be paid to act. So yeah, there was not a clean take of the courtroom scene with Austin Pendleton opening his defense where I was not laughing violently in some form. So now when you go back and watch it and you see me, the shoulders going or me covering my face, it was just you sad. Know. It you was know. sad. <laughs> and now you know. Now you know the dirty truth that I was, I'm a laugher and I had a hard time keeping it together. Okay, well, at some point you do. When he comes back to you, you know, and he, he, he says, I get a little nervous. <laughs> a little? Yeah, I know. It's like, it's like, I'm getting better. But yeah. By that time, I was ticked off. And I even told him, and by the way, Austin is one of the most talented, as talented a man as he is. And he's an incredible Broadway director, actor, film actor, television. He's done everything. As talented a man as he is, he's even nicer. He's a great human being and such a sweetheart. And I said to him, because again, I don't know how much your audience knows about how the logistics of filmmaking. So you'll shoot a scene they call the master shot where they shoot like a pulled out version. Like imagine the camera zooming out, you know, panning and then just taking a master shot of everything that's going on. Once they get that, then they start taking two shots, single shots over the shoulder. They cover, they cover that scene. So that one scene may take days to shoot. So I said to Austin, my lawyer, I said, like, Austin, look, when they do my close up. Can you just, you know, because in order for the, your, your eye line to be correct, you know, I want him to move on the stage where he would go to do his lines. But I said, do me a favor. Don't do your lines with too much gusto because I won't be able to keep it together. I'll start to laugh. He's like, no problem. I'll just walk around where I go and do my thing. And I said, thank you so much. They start rolling in action. And he does the biggest performance he's ever done. The biggest stutters, the biggest slamming of his hand just to get me. And he's like, is that what you wanted? I was like, yes, Austin. It's exactly what I asked for. Just to get me. Just to get me to get that extra laughter. Terrible, terrible man. Now, he's a wonderful guy, but he, he totally got me. Now, what was it like to be in the, in the courtroom, right? When Joe Pesci's doing those courtroom scenes. And, and when Chris is amazing. I mean, come on, what was that like? Uh, what was it like from like me, the person watching them, or as an actor sort of taking part in it, or both? Both. Well, I, I think the one thing, the first thing, and I think any of the other actors would tell you, the first thing was the heat. Um, it was ridiculously hot. I, I'm sure I could have not dropped the, the, the weight for the film, and I would have lost 40 pounds of water weight just in the courtroom. It was ridiculously hot. So we were all just trying to, am I sweating? God, quickly, get my, get, quickly get my brow while no one's looking. It, it was ridiculous. The other thing I remember is when you're, 
the nice thing about having great actors around you is it's you can't not be in the moment you you are just listening and attentive and you know because really you know any actor will tell you that so much of it is just listening and reacting reacting naturally and just being in the moment if you're in the moment the reactions and they will happen so the actors i was with I, they're so talented it made it very easy to just be in the moment that being said there's a part of you that kind of steps back sometimes and says wow these guys are amazing look at that great job they're doing and you don't want to go there because you want to be in the moment as a as the character not necessarily as the actor but you couldn't help but marvel at you know joe's timing ralph amazing and marissa when she did her big speech um several big speeches in the courtroom i remember thinking she is amazing then when we went to watch dailies and dailies when you're on location again for your listeners and viewers who don't know when you're shooting on location not in hollywood but we go somewhere else to shoot um they always whatever you shoot the next day they send the reels back to you on location so, you, so the editor who's on location with you can watch and edit that scene with the director they start editing the next day it's crazy jonathan lynn our director was generous enough to take me in the editing room as a young actor to show me what the camera was seeing he goes, here's what you're doing. Here's what the camera's seeing. Here's why I shot it this way. So it was a real educational experience for me, as well as being a great experience as an actor. When I watched Marissa's performance in that courtroom in person and then watching it again on camera as the camera saw it, I said to Jonathan, it's like, she's going to win an Oscar. She's amazing. And I said those words. So when people say, were you shocked when she won the Oscar? I was like, no, because I saw it there while I was doing it. And then I saw it on the screen when we were editing the dailies on location she was that good so it was really an incredible experience i was lucky as a performer to be able to work with great actors like that it makes my job that much easier it makes me look great it makes my job easier just in terms of acting off of other people that are so good but yeah i mean i'd love to be able to say i was just in the moment every moment and i try to be but as a human being you do step back and go wow they're really good i can see why they're here okay gotta go back to acting now so yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was really neat. Was there a moment in time where you thought, yeah, this is this, this movie's, you know, there's magic happening here. Um, I think when I read the script, that was the first moment that I realized there was something special. I don't think it even took getting to the shooting of it. When I read the script, Dale Lawner wrote the script. It's an ama he's an amazing writer. It was an amazing script. It was very, you know, a lot of times a script will undergo many iterations, many changes before it hits the screen or even when you're shooting something you'll start to fiddle with things this didn't need any fiddling it was just great so while you're you're, you're reading things or the words off the page you're like okay this is something which is really why i wanted to be a part of it and why i really wanted to get as an actor you don't want to get attached to something right away because it's like you don't want to be disappointed if you don't get it i was like oh i'd love to be in this movie it's so well written and then once we started shooting and you see those actors bringing those amazing words to life I think you know pretty quickly that it's something special. I had a similar reaction to Friends when I read the script for Friends because I was originally auditioning for Ross and for Chandler. You could see it on the page. And then when you get there in person and you see the other actors working so well off each other, you know. And that's what it was like with Vinny just from the first day. Wow. Even oh, the the judge, <coughs> the Herman Munster. I can't remember his real name. Fred Gwynn. Fred Gwynn. That's <laughs> Amazing. Even to get that opportunity, right? That I mean, that had to be, uh, you know, nice i had to get an opportunity to work opposite him certainly well, you know. yeah yeah and he's been an amazing actor for years i know people tend to think of him as herman munster because you know you know he's very well known for that character yeah. but he was an amazing actor he i loved him in cotton club i don't know if a lot of people have seen cotton club it's a great movie he was great in that movie um he's he's been a wonderful actor for years and i in a way it sort of a, does him a disservice a little bit that people just think of him for the people that don't know all the other stuff that he's done, I mean, not a disservice. It's, you know, people know what they know, right? But he's such a talented guy. And again, a sweet guy, very intimidating, very big guy. And a man of few words, he would just sort of give you that look, just like, he, you know, the eyebrow thing that he would give you that in real life. Just like, oh, did I upset you? And he was like 6'4", 6'6". Six, six. He was a huge guy. So, but he was as sweet as can be. And uh, yeah, no, it was great. It was fantastic. You had such great chemistry with, with Ralph, I thought. Um, I mean, but part of what makes the movie, uh, this, I mean, obviously, despite the fact that Joe Pesci had great chemistry with Marissa Tomei, and, uh, I mean, I think part of what makes it is that you and Ralph Macchio had great chemistry, right? Stanley Rothenstein, you know, it, you, you guys connect 
in a way that you're, it's believable, your friends, even when you're fighting outside the courtyard about, you know, about, you know, wanting to fire Vinny or right. you know, with your mother, would she rather you died for the role, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, but you could see that in that interaction, it almost felt like you were real friends. I thought the chemistry really helps move the, 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 you know, the story along. I think I, I thank you for saying that. And I think, you know, it, it, it's sometimes really hard. And I'll tell you what happened with Ralph and I, but when you think about it, when you're doing a movie where there are existing relationships, pre-existing relationships, I think that's one of the tougher things because a lot of, you can't really, it's hard to act history. It's hard to act a history with a person. Uh, it's great. It's, it's great. I mean, a lot of people, we, we have to because you don't have the luxury of having that time or having that backstory or having an existing relationship with someone you're actually working with. Um, I know a lot of times they'll get cast together before if they have the time, if they have the luxury of time to do that. Ralph and I got to test together in New York and then we got to um, spend some time together in Georgia before we shot and hang out together. We became friends instantly and we got along very well instantly. So we were really lucky in that way. So I feel that we had that rapport from the first time we met, which was really fortunate because it's not always that way. People don't, you know, not that people don't get along, but people don't always instantly click, click to the point where on screen they have that rapport, that, uh, that immediate chemistry that reeks of, hey, I could see these guys were actually friends. And I appreciate that you saw that or you felt that because we got along really well very quickly. And I think we were fortunate in that way. I hate to think, man, if we didn't like each other, maybe the movie would have sucked, but no, no, at least it wouldn't, maybe just wouldn't have looked as natural for us, but no, we got along. We, we still talk to this day, you know, we still text each other and I don't get to see him as much because he's back East and I'm out here, but uh, Ralph's a fantastic guy. And I got to spend time with his wife and it was just really nice. We, Cause when you're, again, when you're on location, you sort of bond together because you're in a place that you don't know and sure. you're shooting six days a week. So you have one day off. And we would usually go to the mall together in Atlanta and just go shopping or go eat together. So we were like two old men just trolling the mall for food and clothes. And then we come back to our houses and go, hey, we had a nice day off together today, but we had a great time. And, uh, you know, uh, we were very fortunate, I think, that we that we did have that chemistry right off. And I'm, I'm glad it paid off, too. Do you have a favorite scene? Picking my favorite baby. It's not right. Um <laughs> I, I think the scene that I was most looking forward to and ended up shooting almost at the end of the movie, which is really strange. Again, films are shot out of order. It's based on when actors are available and when uh, locations are available. So we actually shot the prison cell scene when Joe came in thinking again, uh, thinking that I was, you know, he was a predator and I was his, you know, reward. Um, that scene was shot in Lee Arendale Correctional Facility in Georgia. I think it was in, was it in Covington? Not Covington. It was outside Covington. But, and it was a real working prison. There were not actors. There were some extras, but uh, background, but uh, mostly prisoners. Um, and that scene in the, in the prison cell, when he came in, when I read that again, when I read that in the script, Tony, I was like, oh my God, I cannot wait to do this. And unfortunately, I think we shot that week eight out of 10. On a 10 week shoot, that was like between week eight and week nine. And I was so bummed because I wanted to get that done. I wanted to get in there and jump in, but it's probably, it's probably better that it, that it took place when it did. Cause we were all, by that time, we all knew each other. We were all relaxed and it probably made for a better shot anyway. But that prison cell scene on paper, just, I was laughing reading it. And what a lot of people don't know is we actually shot a completely different version back in the day. I don't know if they, I don't think they do this anymore but we shot a different version to be shown on airplanes because back in the day, airplane movies would be edited specifically. They couldn't have curses and curse words in them. The theme, the, the content had to be more, you know, on the straight and narrow. So you had to do different versions to be shown on airplanes. So we did a version of that scene, completely no curses whatsoever. When Joe said, you know what, I don't know what you're doing here, but I didn't come here to play patty cakes. He said something else in the movie that I won't mention here. And I'm like, I don't even know what patty cakes is, but I want no part of that. Like it's some prison game that I don't know. And I think, I almost think the the, the cleaner version was as funny, if not funnier, just because of how awkward it was. Awkward it was. And I, 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 I still try and find that airplane version of that scene. I haven't been able to yet. If you do let me know. Um, but yeah, the, the, uh, the prison cell scene that got me, although I did not laugh when we shot it. I was a very, I was a little bit frightened, but uh, still uh, to that, uh, to this day, that's still one of my favorite scenes in any movie I've done. 
Well, one of the things I really love to focus on here is creativity, right? Because I do think, and you're, and you're really touching upon it by what you're saying, there's such a collaborative uh, force behind filmmaking and anything really in entertainment, which is different than, let's say, the novelist, right? The novelist has their computer and that's it, and, and they're telling the story that's in their head. Uh, but in your field, you know, there, there's this just huge collaborative process. Absolutely. So there's, there's the writer who puts that and creates paper characters, right? The paper version, right? And then there's the actors who come in and they breathe life into these paper parts, right? And they and they give the characters their, their nuances, their quirks. Uh, and then there's the, you know, the the, the director, you know, the, the cinematographer, you know, who Absolutely. visually visually takes us through the story, right? The visual storyteller and the editor who picks the right cut. And uh, so, I mean, it's such, by the time you get to the end, there's just this, this tremendous amount of hands, I think, that have been in making it what it is. Absolutely. So it definitely is collaborative. In that regard, you are, you are working with paper paper person right so stanley rothenstein or what you know whatever the character is they, they've handed you the paper version of them what does the creative process look like for you you know you get that version and, and then what how do you move to the to, to creating that character i think it comes down to relatability um and even and you'll hear people talk about this even when they're playing a villain uh, you, especially when you're, it, it's a lot easier, obviously in a comedy, when you're playing a character that's kind of close to yourself, similar sensibilities, similar sense of humor. It's a little tougher when you're playing something that's far removed from yourself, but you have to find the relatable moments. You have to find the relatable qualities of that character. Um, no bad guy thinks he's a bad guy, right? Every bad guy feels that their commitment is hundred percent correct. And you have to find what's relatable to you within that committed bad guy or the part that's relatable to you. Not necessarily that you're a killer or that you're a bad person, but the commitment to, oh, I can see where if this was my point of view, I'd have to be committed to that 100% and I wouldn't think it was wrong. And so there's a relatability factor. So I think when you're reading a script, you're trying to find some commonality, if not with the character, with the moment, with the situation that you're put in. Once you find that commonality with that character, it makes it much easier to have those words be your words. That's the first, it all happens the first time when you read it um, and you find that common ground, you find the humor, you find the timing because again, any sort of script uh, acting, there's a musicality to it as well. There's a rhythm to it. There's a pacing to it. So once you find that commonality, you find the rhythms of that character, the pacing of that character, uh, and that is greatly helped by what's on the page. Um, having a writer like Dale Lawner that knows the language of comedy, the rhythms of comedy, the timing, because a lot of the timing, a lot of the beats, yes, actors can put those beats in those moments in absolutely, but it is very collaborative because a lot of those beats, a lot of that rhythm is already built into the script, the musicality of the words and the back and forth between characters are very much, I, I use musicality a lot because it does have a certain dance and a certain rhythm to it as you're watching, even if it's just words, the back and forth, uh, that's taking that extra hesitation, that extra beat waiting to say your line sends a message and that's part of the, that's part of the the music of it as well so finding that rhythm finding the commonality and then once you're actually on the sound stage and breathing life into it it can take on it can take on a life of its own because things are going to happen that you didn't anticipate and if you're fortunate enough to work with actors and directors that allow you to okay we didn't see this version of it happening, but let's try it this way because it sort of feels right within the conscious of what we're doing. And suddenly something else happens that you didn't think was going to happen. And that's sort of like the magic of when you're actually there. But I think, Tony, it actually starts on the page. And, you know, listen, some, I remember you taught, you mentioned Neil Simon because um, Brighton Beach, I guess, was the first one that I did on the road, then came back to Broadway, understudied on Broadway for a while. And you, we were very, we were, they were made very sure to tell us when it came to Neil Simon, do not add an extra it, uh, the, no extra words whatsoever. It's Neil Simon is, you know, he's a craftsman and you're doing the play and they no no ad libbing, no anything. I think when you're doing a film, there's a little more wiggle room. Even when you're working with great writers like Dale Lawner, there's a little more wiggle room, the writer, director, producer, all together saying, hey, can we play a little bit here? Can we try something a little different? In fact, there are a couple of ad lib moments uh, when she's reading the charges against us when we're first being arraigned in the courtroom and she calls me Stanley Rothenstein 
And I turned to Ralph, and this wasn't in the script. I just turned to Ralph. I said, it's Steen, not Stein. I get very angry that she mispronounced my name. Now, here are two guys that are potentially on trial for their lives, although it was just the arraignment at that point, potentially on trial for your life. And I was more concerned that she mispronounced my name. It bothered me. Now, it bothered me, the person, and I thought it would probably bother the character as well. It's like, look, it's bad enough we're here. We don't belong here. Could you at least get my name right? So <laughs> that moment, that. and so that was an ad lib, I think, in the prison cell scene um, when I'm talking to Ralph about, you know, what happens in these places? And some big guy named Bubba comes in and wants to make you as, that wasn't in there as well. And I remember the director saying to uh, our, you know, Jonathan Lynn saying to Paul Schiff, our producer, is Bubba funny? Is, is, is that all right to say Bubba? He's like, yeah, he's, you know, he, he's like, yeah, it's funny. Bubba's good. So Paul's like, Paul gave the thumbs up for Bubba. It stayed in. So there are these moments, you know, there are these ad lib moments that happen. There are, I'm sure there are others in the film, but you have to have a generous support staff. And that, and that means the support staff. I mean, the, you know, the support of your director, your writer, your producer that give you the freedom to sort of play. But going back to your original question, I think, you know, that whole process starts the first time you take a look at that. Because the first time you read that script, you're already finding the parts of it that are incredibly relatable to you and that make it easier for you to portray that on the screen. Um, so that you're just, again, once the words become rote, you're just in the moment and doing your thing. Uh, you're not thinking about the words. You're in the situation. You have an idea of where this character is mentally in this state for this particular scene. And then you go. And sometimes you'll get something. And I think that was the beauty of doing stage for so long is that it was never the same. And the same thing between takes of a film, depending on what I got from another actor, what I got from them, maybe got a different reaction out of, out of me. That was something that wasn't planned. And that's the wonderful thing about being on stage as well is that every night, yes, it's the same script, it's the same show, but it could be a different performance every night, depending on your rhythms, your, your fellow actors' rhythms, what happened on stage. So that was the cool part about the film as well. Every take was a little bit different. And that's what makes the director and the editor's job so difficult because depending on what, what take from what scene at what angle they choose, you can make a thousand different movies. So just because right. you have a great script doesn't guarantee you're going to have a great movie because you have a great script. Well, the actors have to bring it to life. The director has to make sure he gets the best and shoot his the editor has to help cut that. I mean, there, it's such a collaborative thing. It really is. It's not just a cliche or something that people say to sound humble. It really is. You know, it, it starts, what could start, start out as an amazing script may be not so amazing a movie because the process from there didn't either do the script service or, you know, something happened along the way where, you know, people didn't have the, the comfort of working together or didn't get the right guidance or the, it could go a million different ways. But you have a great, you know, group of people around you, you can make something wonderful. I think for my cousin Vinny, Obviously, something very magical happened for this many decades. We're still talking about it, right? A 30-year-old movie, that's that's crazy. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty wild. Uh, yeah, I can't I can't compliment it enough. I mean, uh, definitely but one of the I think the, I think one of the best movies ever made. Oh, I um, love that you think that. I yeah. love that. That makes me very happy. <laughs> and, and just seeing your face actually makes me smile. And it brings me right back to, to the first then time I, I ever Then saw I've the done movie. my job. <laughs> Did you always want to be an actor? Uh, no. I, the first job I remember wanting to <laughs> wanting to have was being an air traffic controller. <sighs> I was seven years old, okay. and I was staying with my my grandparents in Florida. My mom traveled a lot. She was an actress and she a singer, and she performed all over. I was in Florida with my grandparents, and I passed by uh, the airport, and I saw that building, you know, ab above the ground. And I was like. I want to work there. And my grandfather was like, you want to be an air traffic control? I'm like, yes. I don't know why. And then once I got older and realized, oh, now I know what that is. I don't think that's for me. Not that there's anything wrong. It's a very important job. It keeps us all very safe. Thank you for the people that do it. Um, I ended up going, I think I told you this earlier, to the high school performing arts, the, the school that fame was based on. In fact, they were shooting the movie fame while I was there to tell you how old I am. Um, they offered me a part in the movie at the time. I was like, no, I want to go to camp. So I turned it, it was like a small part in the background. I was like, no, I'd rather go to camp. Thank God I ended up doing movies later. I would have been really upset. Um, and after four years at the high school performing arts, which is, you know, pretty intensive theatrical learning to be an actor. After four years of that, 
I knew I wanted to go to college, but I don't think I wanted to take the acting route in college because I'd just done that for four years in high school and it was very intense. I wanted a different experience for college, sports, academics. So I sort of got away from that in college. I was playing hockey and I was, you know, hardcore academic school. I went to Colgate. So there was a lot of academics there. I actually woke up for some of my classes and um, I think it was after my freshman year that I started missing it a little bit and went mm. back to New York and I got an agent and a manager and I started working a little bit. And by the end of my junior year, I was so not just well, distracted flying back and forth and doing different stuff. And uh, Colgate said, look, take a semester off, get your grades back up and then come back. And oh, I said, OK, went back to New York, went to Hunter College. Got a 4.0 for a semester, was doing my acting at the same time, and then Brighton Beach Memoirs, the national tour, one of the tours came along. I was like, okay, I can go back to Colgate and I could finish up my senior year and get it done, or I could go on this tour of and Neil Simon play. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the greatest playwrights who ever lived and yeah. do this show. And I thought, well, school will be there for me if I want it you know, when I'm done, I have to take this opportunity because as an actor, you don't know when those opportunities are going to come or if they're going to happen again. So I went, I went on the road and that was the beginning of my career. And I, I still have that semester and a half left of Colgate <laughs> that I need to finish to get my degree. They're waiting. They're waiting it, still. It, yeah. I, I think they stopped waiting a few decades ago, maybe more, but I'd like to think they're still waiting. Um, but that sense of completion with me, I do want to finish at some point, whether it's doing it remotely out here or through the, you know, Cal State or, you know, program. I don't know, but I still feel like I have unfinished business. I want to get my degree because it bothers me. I was always an academic guy. The idea that I would not have my degree is like, how can I be an academic guy and preach that to my kids when I haven't finished it myself? So at some point I will finish. So if Colgate's listening, you're yeah, ready I, now. <laughs> exactly. If the registrar is listening, what about, you know, an honorary degree? I don't know if I've gotten that famous. I have not. I could tell you I'm not worthy of an honorary degree. Not yet. No, not I think you are. I think you should call them on my are. behalf. I think I, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to start a petition. I think a write in to Colgate for you. I would love you for that. <laughs> That's um, it's on my to-do list. <laughs> Consider it done. <laughs> Thank you. And you went on and to do a Bioxy Blues, I think it was, right? Bioxy Blues, yeah. Bioxy Blues, Blues, yeah. Blues, right? Also, a, a theater, you know, Broadway. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was a tour. I did the tour of that as well. Um, but I didn't do Broadway Bound, which is the third one, because it was a trilogy of plays. That's the one that I have not done. So I guess I have to put that on my completion list. But now if I went back and did that, I have to play a much older character. Because I'm, yeah. I'm much too old, um, yeah, to play Eugene. I, I can't play Eugene anymore. Those days are over. Yeah, that made the that made well. You know, you never know. <laughs> you never know. Actors play different ages all the time. I this say you true. still have it in you. I say you still have it in you. I like to. St I, I still have that Eugene in me somewhere. But you remember the first time you stepped out on stage? Oh that, God, yes. Yeah, I mean that has to be something impressed upon you forever. The first time the the curtains up and you're like, wow, I'm in a Neil Simon play, and you take your first step on stage. I think that has to be burned somewhere in the back of your retina. Yeah. And I think especially, I mean, the first time my first professional gig was a play called A Thousand Clowns. Uh, it's a, wonder, a wonderful, wonderful play that became a movie as well that Jason Robards was in. And um, that was at the Sharon Playhouse in Sharon, Connecticut. I remember that. Um, but doing something like Brighton Beach Memoirs for the first time, I mean, I remember even though I was going on tour, talk about before I even got on stage to play the part. When I was cast, I had to be approved by Neil Simon and Gene Sachs. Gene Sachs, the original director of the Broadway show, because at the time it was still on Broadway when I was on the road. So they had to approve all touring casts. So I remember going to the theater that Brighton Beach Memoirs was in, that was playing in, getting on that stage. And it was like a classic, you know, what you see in the movies kind of moment. There was a giant light in my face. I couldn't see in the audience. They were like, hey, Mitchell, this is you know, Mr. Simon, Mr. Sachs. I'm like, hey guys, I can't see you, but I assume you're out there. Hello. And I had to audition for them and do a monologue in front of them. And that was nerve wracking. I would um, think. Especially because it's Neil Simon. These are his words. It's Gene Sachs and don't mess this up. So I got the seal of approval, ended up going on the road, but especially Tony, that part, because 
it's one of the unique parts, I think, in theater because there's this fluid. I mean, it's been it's been done since, but it's this fluid transition between breaking the fourth wall, the character talking to the audience, and then seamlessly going back in and acting on stage with the rest of the cast in that moment. So it's it's a very strange sort of dichotomy and dynamic of doing that. And it's, an, it's a really cool character because you get that interaction with the audience, but then you go back into the play and then you come out. And there's a lot of sort of responsibility on the shoulders of that character because you're sort of carrying the direction of the show because you're going in and out so much. And I think you feel that, especially as a young actor, you kind of feel that pressure like, huh, I better not mess this up because I got to get us to that scene and I have to walk from the audience from here. So just, you know, the, the sheer, the responsibility of it coupled with the fact that, wow, I'm, I'm touring in this amazing show that I loved seeing on Broadway and now I'm doing the show. And it's, it, it, it was amazing. It was nerve wracking and amazing at the same time. Do you enjoy, and perhaps the answer to this is I, I enjoy them all in their own category. Like I love, like I love all my kids, you know, the same, but different, uh, right? Uh, but do you enjoy more being in a, a play, being in a film, being in television? Do, do you have a favorite genre? Maybe that's the best way of asking I, I it. think they're all amazing. And I'm not saying this to be like middle of the road guy. Like, I don't want to answer your question. I'll just be, take the easy way out. Um, I like them all. I love them all for different reasons. They're all incredibly rewarding for different reasons. Stage has that immediate reaction. The energy, uh, right? That energy, that visceral response, that play between actor and audience, even though you're not playing to the audience, there is that back and forth. Um, and you get that immediate reaction for something that you're doing. And as an actor, you know, actors love to be loved. Um, no, but you really love to get that feedback immediately. You know when they're in it. You know when they're sucked into the story. You know when they're getting it. Um, and you hear it right away. Um, a film is not like that. Uh, a film, you get absolutely zero reaction, but you're creating something and you're crafting something that is going to live unchanged unless it's a Star Wars film, which they constantly change 10 years or 20 years later. But uh, most films or unless they're colored or corrected or updated for 4K. All right, let's just go for the most part. Films kind of live, once they're done, they're done. At least that's the way it used to be. Um, so you're crafting something that is being finely tuned for one presentation over mm -hmm. a lifetime. So there is, a, again, a hefty responsibility, but there is that great, that great luxury of being able to craft that experience over multiple months, multiple weeks and multiple months um, to sort of fine tune and get exactly what you want. And you don't have that luxury in any other art form in terms of, you know, as an actor. So there's something super special about that as well. And then television is almost the perfect storm of both of them because you're shooting, it, it depends. If you're shooting an audio, a show with a live audience, yes, you're crafting it over the period of like five days of fine tuning, rehearsing, but then once you perform, you get multiple takes kind of like a film, but you also get that immediate visceral response from a live audience that's there. At least they're there for the first two hours. Um, so television kind of combines the fun stuff of all of it, mixed in with the fact that it's the cushiest schedule in the, in the entertainment industry. You're shooting for one day. Your rehearsals are like, you know, eight hours for the other days. It's great. You get your weekends to come home, and then the next week you start a brand new episode. It's really fun. A live audience show is one of the great experiences you can have, one of the great jobs you can have in Hollywood. So they're all really great for different reasons. Um, yeah, and I think I appreciate them all for those reasons. I think now, um, yeah, now I'd go, I'd go back to any one of them. I think stage would be obviously the hardest because when you're not on stage, when you're not in a show, I'd go visit my friends that were on Broadway, and I'd go back to their dressing room before they're, you know, like, 45 minutes before showtime just to say, hey, and they wouldn't be in wardrobe yet. And I'd sit there and like, aren't you going to, aren't you going to put your wardrobe on and get your makeup on? I'd, I'd start to get nervous for them. My friends would be like, dude, you, you do this for a living. What, you know, I, I don't get ready until like 20 minutes before. What's the big deal? Why are you nervous? I, I can't, it, when it's not you, you get very, I start to get, I was like, I can't be here. I can't be in this room. I can't be in your dressing room. So it's, it's very funny how you react to that experience when you're removed from it a little bit. I think theater would be the hardest to go back to because as you get older, it does get harder to remember. Um, it is a little harder on the brain. Although people would say, how do you remember all those lines? The lines were never an issue for me. 
I, I was I was off book very easily and remembering all the lines was not a problem, even for Brighton Beach Memoirs, which is a whole bunch of monologues put together. But I think at this point in my life, it might be tougher to remember, but I'm sure I can get through it. Wow. Yeah, I, th- I would think that would have been one of the hardest things to memorize the lines. Um, I think, yeah, I think once it, once I think you if you do it enough and it becomes rote, mm-hmm. you do the lines enough, you work with someone, just get the lines out there. No acting, just get the lines in. Then worry about the acting in the rehearsals and let that sort of happen naturally. Once the lines are no longer a barrier holding you back, then you could just focus on being in the moment and being, you know, being a good actor. But I think you really have to get those lines out of the way as quickly as possible. So they're not something that you're focusing on. And you just focus on, like I said, if you could just have those lines tucked away, you know they're there. And then just focus on being in the moment with your fellow actor, you're going to be golden. I say that as if it's the easiest thing in the world. It's not. But I I think that's the best way to approach it. Now we have to talk about friends. Oh, Course. Of course. <laughs> iconic iconic so you're you're the fiance right that you're it, the whole show kicks off right with jen franiston's character showing up running out uh, you know running out on her fiance uh, and, and you're the fiance right? so what you're saying is there's no friends without barry that's what you're saying correct i'm saying there's no friends without barry <laughs> that's what i wanted to hear yeah it's like it's so funny because that character it's really the impetus for jennifer aniston's you know entrance into the show so Absolutely. And like I said, I originally was up for Ross and Chandler. And I and I was very close to getting Ross at the end. Uh, they were negotiating a deal. And then the last one, it's like, well, we have one more guy we want to see. And then, I, you know, David Schwimmer ended up, ended up getting it, which was wonderful because he's perfect for the part. And I think it's tougher now for my wife. Like, you you were almost, I was like, yeah, but I don't think, I don't think of it that way that I was almost one of the other cats. Like, I got to play Barry. I was on the show. I had a great time. Who, who could say they got to do that, you know? So I was never one of these like look back and, oh, why didn't I get that? Because that could be so destructive as an yeah. actor. Um, but I was thrilled to do Barry because it came to me after I did, ended up not getting, you know, Ross. And they said, would you be interested? And I was like, heck yeah, I love this show. I love the script. I'd love to be a part of it. So that's how Barry ended up coming about. They offered it to me because I'd come so close to get Ross. So yeah, that was crazy. Right. And so- Again, you become the cat, you know, you become her, you know, literally that's how she shows up on the show. Right. So you have a lot to live up to, I think, because we hear about you before we meet you, right? <laughs> yes. And that's always probably more difficult when you, when you hear about the legend, right? Before you actually get to meet the person, you have a certain, um, I don't know, I, I, I think that has to be, that has to be harder. Um, well, it's sort of like, you know, reading a book and then going to see that movie because you've already created this character. I think that's even harder when you're making a book into a movie, when you think about it, because all these people have created the visual, how that character looks and sounds from reading the book. And then you go to a movie and go, that doesn't match what I imagined. Because I had this whole preconceived notion of what that character, what Harry Potter looks like. That's not my Harry or that's not my... So when you hear about a character, when you they, I'd say, thank God I didn't have to live up to that. You're just living up to a few like horrible stories about me. So I, I didn't have... When you think about it, the bar was set pretty low from the beginning. <laughs> so it was pretty good. As long as I wasn't too horrendous, I could probably live up to it and pull it off. <laughs> yeah. No, well, <laughs> I probably agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I just think it's a li- when you, every time you lean, you know, you're you're coming after the, you've been hearing tales of somebody. Right. I, I think it's a little bit more difficult because, like you said, uh, and I, g- I agree with what your your analysis. Uh, I read a lot, and there've been many times I've seen movies after the fact, and I say, you know, that didn't live up to the book. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's just me doing exactly what you said. I'm not sure. Maybe it's just that I already had it in my head what it what it right. would play out like, and and maybe that's exactly it. Um, but I, I think you come on and you nail it, right? You you come on as as Barry, and you're everything we could have possibly wanted you to be. You live up to the tale. I don't know huh. if that's a good thing or a bad thing that I lived up to Barry. I can't decide. It's probably a little bit of both. <laughs> so now, what's that like? I mean, tell me about your first day on set. Um, you know, I I wasn't too concerned about living up to it because. I sort of felt connected to it already because I went through the process right. of the original script. Um, and I think, what, when was I on? Like the second or third episode that ended up coming on? Uh, I remember thinking to myself before I went on that I, when I read the script, I said to my agent, this show is going to be a hit. Um, 
again, that that's happened very few times in my life. Um, when I've read something and thought this is going to be something special. So, and when you were on set, could you feel it too? You could feel that magic on set too? Oh, once I saw the other actors, what they were doing, because again, the script was already fantastic. Add to that equation actors that perfectly pulled off those characters. Wonderful actors that really nailed those parts. The time, Again, the timing of it, because talk about a dance or musicality with language. I mean, look at Friends. It's all about timing and interaction, and the, it's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch. So the first time I was there, I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be a huge hit. It, it really, it really didn't take long to figure that out. And I, I didn't feel, I don't think, I didn't feel out of place. I didn't feel intimidated because like I said, I felt like I was sort of connected to it already in some weird way because I had already auditioned so many times for the other characters. It just felt comfortable to me. And the other actors were very generous, making me feel comfortable. And I think at the time, I also had my own show called Minor Adjustments on NBC. So I was already doing a show on NBC at the time. So it was really great. I had my show, then I came to this one um, and was doing, you know, Barry. So it was really, it was really a wonderful time in my life because I had all this stuff going on and it was kind of nice. And I think also when you have other things going on, uh, you don't focus too much on one thing or obsess about that one thing. So I think it made for a better experience for me on Friends because I was already doing, you know, uh, minor adjustments with Rondell Sheridan. We were doing that show together. And this is another thing that I was doing. So it was just wonderful fun. And I think it's sort of, I tell, I tell the actors, cause sometimes I've been asked to speak, you know, to large groups and, you know, talk to young actors. And it's like, they say, what's the, what advice could you give young actors? What advice would you give other actors? I said, oh, I said, always have other things in life that give you joy, have other things in life to focus on. Cause when you're focusing on one thing, it can sometimes either not be healthy in terms of your mind and just living and dying by that one thing every day, but it just brings more to you as a person to have other things going on in your life. It probably makes you a better actor to have other things going on in your life. And I think that's what applied for me with friends. I had, I, I wasn't, I couldn't focus too much or obsess about that show because I was doing my other show. But like I said, at the same time, I felt very comfortable with these actors. They're very welcoming. Um, the creators were welcoming the director. I mean, it was, it was a very, it was a really good experience. Sure. And I think you and Jennifer Aniston were hysterical together. Um, Thank you. I know <laughs> I knew Jennifer before that we had the same manager in New York. So I had known Jennifer before that for several years. And uh, yeah, she's but honestly, she makes it very easy to look good. She makes it, she makes, makes it very easy to look, you know, to have chemistry with. She's very, very good to work with. Her timing is excellent. Um, and it's funny that people make a big thing about that. I don't know why people make such a big deal about or, or are shocked when they see uh, actresses that have incredible comedic timing. And I think I'd like to think at this point in our evolution as a society, you don't see that as much like she's really good. It's like, yeah, she's brilliant. She's a great actor. She's got a brilliant timing. But for some reason in comedy for years, that was more thought as a male driven. Oh, you're thinking about comedy stars on TV. That's men. I like, you know, I thought that Lucy would end that years ago, you know, and that sort of, you know that idea but even you know even into the 80s and 90s there was this idea that uh on television half hour comedies are driven by men but that show had such great strong and creative and incredibly talented women um she made it incredibly easy for me to work with so there there's my there's my rambling my social justice rambling for this for this interview but yeah she's incredible you have a favorite scene from from friends that you filmed well um I don't know. I, I do like awkward. Awkward always makes me laugh. Uh, awkward situations always make me laugh. Those are the kind of stories that are more fun to tell. No one wants to hear a story about, you know, well, I won't even go there, but awkward stories are always funnier. So I think when we were in the uh, dentist chair, post bliss, I will say for the purposes of our interview, um, and we're cuddled up in the dentist chair and there was, it was, it was incredibly awkward. First of all, uh, I wouldn't recommend romance in a dentist chair. Uh, if anyone out there is considering it, I'd think twice. Uh, not the most comfortable place to sit or do anything else for that matter. If, if sitting is not comfortable, you can imagine not much else would be comfortable in a dentist chair anyway. Agreed. So the idea that we were there in like half a state of dress with at 120 degrees and all these lights and all these, you know, other people, the crew was there, director and other... It was ridiculous. And people this day was like, what was it like kissing Jennifer Aniston? I was like, 
very awkward because it's not that we didn't get along, but number one, it's someone you know as a friend that now there's romance, which is always kind of weird. Uh, you're sitting in a dentist chair, half dressed, and it's 120 degrees with about 100 people watching. So there's nothing romantic about it. It's just awkward. And so whenever I see it, I start to giggle because I remember how I felt when we were in that chair together going, oh, please, let's get out of this chair. This is awful. But it was just, it was just fun. It's fun for me to watch that. I don't know if it's my favorite in terms of performance or content, but my memory as an actor, the awkwardness of it, 100%. Gets, gets 100% Rotten Tomatoes for awkwardness. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's still, like I said, a great character, a great show. And just to have been part of it, um, you know, it ha has to be pretty exciting to look back and think, you know, in the early stages when, when greatness was being planted, the seeds were just coming up uh, to have been a part of that journey. It's, uh, it's weird. Here. It really, it's uh, the word I use is surreal. And it's true because, you know, as an actor, you, I don't think anyone goes into any job thinking, okay, I want to make sure people are going to be talking about this 30 years from now. I'm going to make sure, you know, you just want to, do good work and, you know, do the best you can. And it's something that you feel good about walking away from saying, you know what, regardless of how it's, regardless, I mean, you, obviously you want people to enjoy it or take something away from it, even with the drama to have an effect and to have it affect people and have them think about it when they're done. And I don't think anyone goes into it thinking, I want people talking about this 30 years from now, especially with a comedy at least. But um, it is surreal between Vinny and friends, the fact that we are still having this conversation this many years later and that they're still relevant. Not just that we're talking about it, but they're still relevant. There's a whole oh, new generation. They're timeless. They're timeless. Yes. Though. Yeah. And that's, you know, my daughter, you know, she's 16. And even when she was like 14 or 15, I guess when she was a, she's going to be a senior now, but even when she was a freshman, it's like, my teacher can't believe that you're Barry from Friends. And that's just when Friends was starting to like make a second comeback with, <clears throat> whether it was going on Netflix or, and got this whole new audience of like young, you know, young people that are watching. And I didn't even think about it. Oh, yeah, that's funny. He's like, no, no, my teacher thinks that's really cool. It's like, oh, that's awesome. And, you know, and my friends don't believe that you're my dad. Because <laughs> truth be told, I mean, mostly now, over the last five or 10 years, I've been doing mostly voice work. I don't do as much on-camera film and television like I used to. So my kids weren't really around for my heyday in terms of people recognizing me from a movie or TV show. Um, so they don't remember that part of my life. So when people do recognize me, I think, you know, my daughter thinks it's fun and gets a kick out of my, my son thinks it's weird. It's like, why are those people looking at you? I don't like that. It's like, it's okay. They recognize me or something. Isn't that, it's weird. Why do they think, why do they care? I was like, uh, I'll, I'll tell you later. So it's, you know, it's still funny to me when it happens, but yeah, the fact that there's relevance 30 years later, I am incredibly fortunate, very fortunate. Indeed. And you mentioned, I have to touch upon quickly. I, I know uh, we're running out of time, but uh, let's, I want to touch upon the fact that you have been doing voiceover work for, you know, some major characters. Uh, uh, what is that like? I mean, do, do you enjoy that as much as the acting or? Oh, God. It, yeah. It's, yeah. When you think about it, Tony, it's still acting. When you think oh, about sure. it, it really, it really now is. Now you I mean, only have your voice, right? To, to and, and, convey and everything. Think, exactly. That, you, you just see here, you're very smart. You are very smart. <laughs> um, I think that people don't realize that when you are, telling a story with you, just your voice. Cause normally when you do a lot of, most of these animated shows, unless you're coming in to redo something, do ADR or to take over somebody's part that, you know, that couldn't continue and they read, they revoice something for the most part, you record the voices first and then animate to voice later. So the voice performance usually comes first. And when you think about it as an actor, like if we're sitting here talking and you say something and I sort of make a face, <sighs> here goes Tony again. Immediately, just by my face, you know, not that I would ever do that to you. I'm just getting an example. Uh, like, oh, no, what is Tony doing? You know, just by my face, like, oh, what's his problem? Why is he upset? Why does he seem like he doesn't like that question? Or why is he annoyed? Because I'm, I could tell a story just with, you know, you, you lift your eyebrow, you just with a look. When you're telling a story with just your voice, you don't have that luxury. The animation is going to come later. That's going to obviously pu push the story forward. The animation finishes telling that story or does a more complete job of telling the story. But when it's just your voice... You, a lot of voice actors know, and some uh, maybe some young ones don't know, that you can't take for granted that people cannot see you. They can't see the smile in your voice. They have to be able to hear the smile. 
You have to be able to hear that intent or whatever it is that you are the subtlety of what you're acting in that moment has to come through in just that voice. And that's what makes voice directors so special and so important. They're not just listening for, okay, did he get the words right? Did it sound good? Did it sound natural? But do I hear all the things that we have to end up seeing? Did I hear that in the voice? So that kind of makes it cool from an actor's perspective. And also, Tony, I get cast in, uh, in animated projects that I could never be ca that get cast in as an on-camera actor. If I'm playing like a 17-year-old, come on, guys, let's go. If I'm playing like the 17-year-old hero of something, no one's casting this as a 17-year-old hero on camera. Not going to happen. It barely happened when I was 17. I beg to differ. Oh, well, you're a sweetheart. That's, you know, that's, you're wonderful. But for the most part, I get to play a lot of parts that I would never get to play on camera. And that's the beauty of the voice world. You get to do things. If you can sound it, you can be it. But you, you might not get those you, opportunities. I mean, you've done things like, like the Transformers, Green Lantern. Uh, I think maybe you were a Ninja Turtle. or I was Donatello, another yeah. another iconic character. I got some really cool stuff. I mean, that those was, are just those are major characters in that in that universe in that world. I mean, absolutely, uh, so much fun to do, especially if you've liked the franchise before. If you're, I was a Transformers and you know Turtle fan before, so the idea that I was doing one of them, I was like, oh man, this is so cool. My, now, my when your kids like were it. little, were they fans? Of the, yes, of the I'm trying to think. My my kids were, my daughter was too small. She was too young. My son actually got to come to the premiere of TMNT, which was at uh, which was at the time was at Man's Chinese Theater. Um, I don't, is it TL, uh, TCL now? I forget which uh, Chinese theater it is right now. Um, but at the time it was Man's Chinese Theater, and uh, he got to come to the premiere. And I remember Cesar Milan was in front of me, and I. I wanted to talk to him because I thought he was so cool. Um, but he, he got to experience that. So my kids have gotten to experience as they've gotten older with the voice stuff, um, some of the stuff that I've done. And now, now they're too old because I'm still doing a lot of the Disney stuff, you know, like Vampirina and um, God, what are some of the other Goldie and Bear stuff that's sort of like a little young for them, of course, but you know, they can go back to hopefully with their kids someday. He goes, oh, that's grandpa's voice. Um, so yeah, <laughs> yeah it, so it's really cool. That's what I'm wondering. Like, would they recognize your voice? Like if they were too little to really understand that that's a job for you, are they right. ever like watching? I think that would be kind of cool and weird. Like they're watching a character, right? And and suddenly like that, that click, like that sounds an awful lot like dad, right? I think on some of them they could. Some of them I don't remember. Because if, if a lot of my voices, like I have uh, friends like Roger Craig Smith is a buddy of mine and he's an amazing voice actor and he does, his range is incredible. He can do everything from the super deep voices to like the tiniest character, amazing versatility. I don't have as much versatility with my voice. I sort of rely more on performance. Um, there's some characters that don't sound a lot like me and I love those because it, it doesn't sound like me, which I think is cool. But a lot of them do sound like me. So my kids would recognize a lot of them. Some of them, maybe they wouldn't, but I got to tell you, Tony, They've seen me in movies on TV. They go, oh, it's daddy. Click, turn the channel. As if anyone like does this anymore. Yeah, that's more, you know, my generation. Yeah, clicking, <laughs> turning the channel. Or the old remote with the, the giant clicky. Yeah, I know, right? The giant button, like the two button thing, up channel, down channel. Sometimes it worked and you'd smash it. Yeah, I know I'm dating myself. But I'm, <laughs> both of us, right? Um, both of us. I remember exactly. moving the antennas around, right? Oh my God, yeah. Stand on one foot. Put the aluminum foil right there. Don't the move. Aluminum foil. <laughs> It's like, how can I not, how can I not move? I'm trying to watch the darn show. I'm trying to watch here. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I feel your pain that I, I can, I have Thank that you. recollection. <laughs> and now you're also on radio, serious radio, yes. your own show. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I do it. Believe it or not, it's a tech show because I love technology. So both Marco Flalo is my co-host and he's been a producer for Sirius XM for years he produces a lot of their NHL stuff and the comedy festivals. And he, he's incredible, incredible, you know, uh, on air personality as well. So we became friends through, through a project. And then Siri, we both love technology. We both talked about all that all the time. And he said, Sirius XM came to me and said, do you want to do a show about technology? I'm like, yes, let's do it. So I guess we've been on for like four years now. I don't even know how long we've been on the air. I should check it out. It's been a long time, but I get to talk tech with, with, with one of my favorite people every week. So to me, that's just like a fun job that I, you know, do on the side that I really enjoy. We've been doing it for a long time and I, I get sent a lot of really cool tech stuff that, uh, that makes me happy because I'm like such a gearhead. But uh, yeah, just like another, another thing that I enjoy doing, you know, again, as I tell other actors, have other things in life that give you joy. 
it makes you a better person, makes you a better actor, at least a healthier person. <laughs> well, your personality is fantastic. So really, you can gravitate to almost anything. Uh, and I think that's Thank why you. you've probably been successful in so many fields, because it's, you're easy to like. Thank uh, you. I appreciate I, that. And I think that probably brings a lot uh, to everything. At, again, your, your roles have always stuck in my brain. Um, my cousin Vinny, again, timeless, iconic, uh, forever, you know, in my like top five all time movies. Uh, and I, I think, I think you made some cinematic history, uh, with that movie. And I think 50 years from now, um, you know, we probably won't be here anymore, <laughs> but, but there's a, still good chance. Able... there's a good chance I won't. Yeah. <laughs> they'll still be watching it and talking about it. And, and you, you mean, you nailed it. I, I really believe that if you take any one of you out, Joe Pesci, Ralph Macchio, Marissa Tomei, uh, or, or Mitchell Whitfield, if you move any one of you out, you're, you're, I just see you're, you're not replaceable. I think Thank that's you. a different movie. The it is a different you, movie. Yeah. The four of you made the movie together, collaboratively made the movie. Um, Thank you. It really, that, it really is. It really is that way. I don't think people, I think once you see it, especially, I mean, you know, people talk, people say to me, it's like, well, if Will Smith was in the movie, that would have been a totally, well, yes, it would have been a different movie. Of course it would have, it would have been a different actor. Um, I'm sure it would have been a great movie, it just would have been a different one. And that's the whole thing. It's really hard once you've seen a movie with a cast that you love, a movie that you love with a cast that you love. It's very, very hard to think of it any differently. It really right. is. I mean, with my favorite movies as well, although you said, Top five uh, that didn't pass me, but it didn't get past me, by the way. I did hear that. So g give me at least one other movie that's in your top five. That's not my cousin Vinny. I like Sabrina with Harrison Ford. Oh. Um, <laughs> I also like the American president with, uh, with Michael um, Douglas. Michael. Oh yeah. That's a good one too. <laughs> he's a single, the single dad one, right? Yeah. He's a single dad and also yep. the president. Of the yeah, United I know. States. <laughs> Those so are great the, movies. The, those like you're, I can never really those those three movies. I bounce around depending upon the given moment. I'm not going to uh, make you choose. It would be very unfair of me to make you choose your favorite baby. I will not do that. <laughs> but though any one of those three in particular, I mean, are my life is just using me for a punching bag. I need to I need to just reset uh, and have just have a moment. Uh, you're my you're my three movies. You know, you reset. You know, you re kind of reset the world for me. Uh, I Thank always you. feel very connected and laugh and truly you, enjoy them. And that's why I say it's cinematic history. You created something that matters to other people. You know, and I talk about this sometimes on the podcast. I know you have to go. I'm just going to make one last comment if I could. No, go for it, of course. But, you know, I, I went, I had cancer and most of my listeners know. And when I was going through that journey, I needed entertainment like that i needed movies that would make me laugh and shows that i could feel connected to just to be reminded that there was joy in the world because i wasn't feeling any of that and that's why i think that your 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 field is very underrated for the service it provides you know everybody talks about it like it must be oh just some you know wild fun thing to do and almost as if it's not really a job but it is a job making it real and funny uh, and relatable to people takes a lot of work it takes a lot of collaborative work to get it done right and you are providing this enormous service to people uh, who you meet your viewer uh, where they are in life. And sometimes viewers are experiencing hard times and they need that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm always enjoy getting the opportunity to talk to a creative person and say, even just thank you. Thank you. Cause you created something that made a difference in my life. And, and I've turned to many times when I needed it. You know, first of all, most importantly, are you okay now? I am. I'm in remission and I have been for, for years. That's fantastic. For six, six years now. I just celebrated my six year anniversary. Okay. That's fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. And you know what? That means a lot. And it's funny. It's funny that you say, not funny, but ironic because when people ask, you know, talk about what we do and sometimes um, there, there are some actors out there and people out there in general, it doesn't matter what field that take themselves a little bit too seriously, uh, make a little bit too much of themselves. And you know, sometimes when we're in groups as actors, it's like, look, guys, we're not curing cancer here, okay? And that's something that we'll all, we'll say to each other, like to keep things in perspective. It's like, look, we're 
we're very well compensated people that get to play for a living. We get to play for a living. Yes, it's a job and yes, it's work, but it's the kind of work that we're very fortunate to have. But like you said, at the end of the day, especially with what you went through, which has great meaning, obviously, what the world is going through now, it's not in the best condition. Uh, and I, I kind of worry about what condition we're leaving in it for my kids. I'll be gone. But I kind of wondering, you know, I feel concerned for what we're going to leave behind. Um, people want to have joy. They want to take those moments of joy. Um, and it's important to have those moments of joy. And different things give us joy. Uh, when, when I'm in my office here, I turn on the television. I, I put on either Fringe or Grimm. I tend to like, or Chuck, I like the one word TV shows. Fringe is my favorite. And I'll have it on in the background as in an endless loop and I'll watch it. I must have seen the, the entire series complete five or six times through and now I'm doing it again. And just because it's, it's like you said, it's like comfort food. It makes me feel happy. It gives me, it makes you feel safe. It makes you feel good. And for that alone, for giving people something that they can gravitate toward or just escape with or just have it on in the background and just when you look or you hear a voice or you have a scene that you, oh, I have to watch this scene and it makes you smile or just gives you that peace for a moment, it has meaning. And whether it's someone that's going through a health crisis or a human crisis, mental health issues, I mean, there's so much going on right now. Uh, I think to have that escape or just that momentary bit of joy, uh, I think it's really important. So the fact that stuff that I've done was that for you makes me feel really good. And I'm not just saying that like, oh, I feel good. It really does. It, it has meaning to me because, you know, like I said, we, we need that. We need that now more than ever. And there are individuals like yourself, people that are going through really hard stuff that need that. So I'm very happy. I'm very happy my work gave that to you. And now when you go back and watch my cousin Vinny in the courtroom and see my shoulders going like, he's right. That, that unprofessional son of a gun couldn't stop laughing the entire scene. Now you're going to know. Now it's going to give you a different kind of joy when you watch it. Now, I can hear a lot of the inside stories. I am going to go back and watch it. Now you're going to look for it. Yeah. Before the weekend is out, I will have rewatched this. <laughs> and I want, yeah, I want to hear back from you. You're going to have to get back to me and let me know like, okay, I saw the shoulders going. I saw the covered face. I got it. You couldn't keep it together. It's like, yep, I wasn't joking. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so I am going to get back to you when I see it. Thank Please you do. so much, Mitchell, for coming on and talking to me. I hope you'll come back again as you're doing new projects and just keep the conversation going. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're doing well. Continued good health. And I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.